Okay, so now we're going to tackle the, the regions of Africa. And one of the points that your book makes is that, unlike some of the other modules we've studied, some of the other continents we've studied, uh, Africa, especially once, you know, obviously there is a distinct difference between North Africa and South Africa or Central and South Africa because of, because of the, uh, the Sahara Desert. Um, but other than that, there's not a, there's no big physiographic feature that defines different regions. You know, unlike, you know, there's no big mountain range. There's no, uh, there's no big island, you know, no, no continent and island sort of thing like we saw in Europe. Um, and so physiographically, you wouldn't think there's a whole lot of distinction between different regions of sub-Saharan Africa. But as we're going to find out in this chapter, there are, there's ethnic differences, there's, there's environmental differences that are going to help us to kind of parcel it out into five separate regions. Okay, one thing that's very interesting about Africa's physical geography or its physiography is uh, the fact that it doesn't have a, a north-south spanning um, mountain range. For example, when we studied Russia, uh, we learned about the Urals, and of course in North America there's the Rockies, and in South America there's the Andes. Well, Africa does not have a similar thing. In fact, Africa is largely a plateau. Uh, most of the inland area is kind of plateaued, and then you have kind of a a drop off as you move toward the coast. Uh, you'll also notice that in the eastern part of the continent, you'll see all these little red lines here. That's indicative of uh, plates that are, in, in most cases, pulling apart. You're actually getting rifts. Uh, so there's the Kenyan Rift Valley, um, where eventually, a, most likely, a sea will be created. Not, not unlike the Red Sea. The Red Sea is essentially an area where plates have been diverging and allowing for uh, a new area of water, in this case the Red Sea to be forming. Okay, a couple of questions to ask yourself as you consider Africa's physical geography. Uh, one thing is, identify the lowland coastal plains or basins, and then identify the plateaus or highlands. Another question is, in what latitude zone is most of sub-Saharan Africa found? So notice that here's the, here's the Sahara, essentially, and through here. So we're studying all of Africa south of the Sahara. The question is, what latitude zone is most of that territory found? Considering the topography and the climate, where might people cluster? Where would you expect to find the population centers in sub-Saharan Africa? And finally, notice how rivers in Africa first flow toward an inland basin and then flow to the sea. The question is, why is that? Okay, so the rift valleys that are described in your book are really just uh, evidence, further evidence, that the Earth's surface has changed over time and continues to change. So those rift valleys are actually the evidence of continuing change um, of processes that have been going along for, on for a long time. Your book describes uh, something called continental drift. Alfred Wegener is uh, the scientist who first proposed continental drift in the early 20th century, around 1912. And he proposed continental drift because of what he saw as being interlocking puzzle pieces. He looked at the shape of South America and noticed how nicely it fit in with the west coast of Africa, just like puzzle pieces and wondered, you know, could those pieces of land that are currently separated by a lot of water, the Atlantic Ocean, could they have at one time been much closer together? Could they have been one part of, uh, a part of just one old, big old piece of land? 
Uh, and he, he thought that because not only did they look like puzzle pieces, but also there was geological features that were consistent across both uh, land areas, common fossils uh, across those same land areas that were found at the same time in Earth's geologic history. So Wegener proposed the idea of continental drift. He was actually uh, kind of joked about for quite a quite a while until decades later. Uh, the mechanism for continental drift, which is actually now what's called plate tectonic theory, uh, really came to light with more modern science, being able to, to see that yes, indeed, the Earth's crust is being produced at some uh, some locations and being destroyed in other locations through a process called plate tectonics that Wegener's continental drift theory was finally accepted as being accurate science. Okay, as we get into the section on Africa's historical geography, it, I think it's, it's worth repeating the very opening words of this chapter, which, in which it says, the African continent occupies a special place in the physical as well as the human world. This is where human evolution began. In Africa, we formed our first communities, spoke our first words, and created our first art. From Africa, our ancestor hominins spread outward into Eurasia more than two million years ago. From Africa, our species emigrated, beginning perhaps 95,000 years ago, northward into present-day Europe and eastward via Southern Asia and Australia, and much later, farther afield into the Americas. Disperse, our forebears did, but we should remember that at the source, we are all Africans. So this next little section describes how the early, early civilizations, the early tribes um, of Homo sapiens uh, moved around Africa and how things changed over time. Uh, at first, it was some of the Western West Africa seemed to be uh, uh, some of the dominant civilizations, and then, and then through uh, cooperation and trade, and uh, as, as is mentioned, complementarity, the fact that certain regions could produce certain things, and other regions could produce other things, and there was some very basic trade. Eventually, the culture hearth sort of moved uh, into East Africa. Okay, so it's worth remembering that European contact didn't occur until the late 15th century in sub-Saharan Africa. So before the Europeans, there was plenty of essentially state formation. Remember what, what a city-state is, because it's mentioned here in the book. It's an independent political entity consisting of a single city, uh, sometimes without, and, and uh, with an immediate hinterland, uh, meaning an agricultural area that supports the town or, or the city. And it actually commenced about 5,000 years ago, uh, where uh, tribes from Nigeria and what is present-day Cameroon essentially moved eastward and, and even southeastward uh, across the continent to what's called the Great Lakes area, you know, something like Lake Victoria and such, and then down towards South Africa. And that's actually where, where the, the Zulu uh, civilization uh, arose. Okay, it was inevitable that European contact would occur in Africa uh, because, of course, the Europeans were trying to find a, an easy route, an easy trade route to Asia, particularly South Asia, to India um, and China. Uh, because, of course, hauling things and trading things over land was very, very arduous. It was much easier to travel via ship transport goods via ship. You didn't need to build roads and that sort of thing. So they were looking for a, an easy route. They, of course, started to, to sail south and had to sail all the way around Africa. Uh, and so inevitably there would be landing uh, on Africa and uh, exploitation of resources in Africa. So that's where the first European contact occurred. And quickly the Europeans did realize that there was, uh, there were resources to exploit and, and, uh, so there was development in Africa, particularly along the coast, particularly along the, the Atlantic coast. And therefore that, sh that kind of shifted the development. Uh, the inland uh, civilizations and societies declined and the coastal societies thrived because of this interaction with the Europeans.
Clearly, one of the resources that Europeans sought to exploit was labor. They needed labor, uh, particularly because they were already colonizing parts of the Caribbean and South America. Remember, they were they were doing plantations, and, which was very labor intensive to grow the sugar and the and the coffee and and such. And they needed labor, and so what well, sort of is un perhaps underappreciated. You know, we think about slavery as just being a uh, a, a exploitation of labor and, and, and essentially taking people from their homeland, forcing them to work in North America, particularly in the, in the southern part of, uh, of the United States. But in reality, there's a lot of slaves taken to the Caribbean to work there and forced to work in South America as well. So um, it perhaps is uh, doing a disservice by just thinking about slavery in America. We also must take into consideration the, the uh, number of slaves who were brought to the Western Hemisphere in the Caribbean as well as in South America. Okay, so some questions to think about as you're looking at this, uh, at this map. Uh, first of all, what, what, do, what specifically do the arrows represent? And you may want to also ask yourself, uh, why are there two different color arrows? Notice we've got green arrows. We also have an orange arrow over here. Uh, what do you suppose the colored areas on the African landmass represent? Notice that on, in Africa, there are different colored areas on, in the uh, equatorial western African coast. And finally, what conclusions can you draw from this map? This is a very interesting figure uh, from your book, uh, we've already established that Europe first started to exploit and, and to a certain extent colonize West Africa in the 15th century. And that would go on for several centuries uh, where essentially the, uh, the, the coast became more powerful um, than the interior region. But by the 19th century, um, Europe decided that they would colonize the entire continent. In fact, they divvied up the continent uh, in a rather arbitrary way in 1884. It's something uh, called the Berlin Conference, which is written about on page 291 of your textbook. And several of the leading powers in Europe just decided, okay, we're going to divvy up Africa uh, this way. And they drew relatively arbitrary boundaries. Um, you can see the different colors as far as how they decided to parcel things out with very little regard or very little knowledge of the existing civilizations, the existing political structures, cultural structures, religious structures. And that arbitrariness um, has essentially then led to the conflict that is, continues to this day in, much, in many portions of Africa. So this slide kind of makes the point that you know, in 1884, when this conference occurred, 80% of Africa was still under traditional rule, quite often you know, so relatively tribalistic um, rule. And all of a sudden, the Europeans decided, OK, we're, go we're going to now take over and drew these very arbitrary boundaries, closed off migration routes, et cetera, et cetera. And that essentially led to the instability, political instability, uh, that continues to this day. Okay, so this is a video that I encourage you to, to check out uh, to learn about a, a what's called the cradle of Swahili culture. It's a little town in Kenya called Lamu. Okay, so hopefully you've picked up on this term post-colonial Africa. And now that Africa is essentially independent states, um, you know, that, that these, that the countries have acquired their independence, mostly in the 20th century. Uh, that's what we call post-colonial Africa. But one thing you notice in your reading is that Africa was set up, obviously by Europeans, to do business with Europe. And so the infrastructure, the railroads, the roadways uh, are essentially set up to take goods and raw materials from the interior of Africa, take it to the coast with a, a, a desire to then ship it abroad. There's very little infrastructure for trade within Africa. 
And that's one of the big problems with Africa's uh, development is the fact that quite often to transport goods, you know, there's, there's very little trade that occurs from one African country to another. There's Africa is more exporting uh, abroad than they do trade internally. Uh, and if you are going to trade internally, quite often the transportation costs are quite prohibitive. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, you have West Africa, you have South Africa, and you also have this Horn of Africa uh, that you'll hear references to in your reading. Now notice the population distribution, the red dots indicate uh, areas of you know, population centers. But one thing that's important to understand, you know, this is a huge, huge land mass. So it's relatively sparsely populated in a lot of regions. And in fact, even taking all these population centers together, as the book points out, all that, all those people added together still make up only about two thirds of the population of China. So generally this huge, huge land mass uh, has a very sparse population. One of the consequences of the colonial era was a change in the way uh, lands were viewed. Up until the colonial era, uh, land was, com was a communal thing. And it wasn't until the Europeans arrived that the idea of private land ownership became uh, in vogue. And that continues to be a problem, uh, obviously, so because during colonialism, lands were stolen away from indigenous people. Uh, but now, trying to restore some of those lands to indigenous people uh, has become, of course, politically controversial. These next two slides continue the pro-con discussion about agribusiness. The fact that um, in a lot of cases, the, the foreign investors, interests of Africans uh, in mind when deciding what to plant or even wh whether to plant or not. Some, in some cases, you've got land that could be farmed but is owned by a foreign business uh, that is just leaving it fallow until commodity prices change. So, you know, that, that's a, that would be a real shame if, uh, if you know, African people would go hungry just by virtue of the fact that there's a speculator somewhere in, the, in a foreign country who decides not to plant that year. For better or worse, in recent years, um, if, you, if you heard of Africa in the news, quite often it was due to epidemics, uh, uh, Ebola or the Zika virus more, more recently. Of course, in addition to, you know, like we've mentioned the Zika virus and Ebola, uh, malaria, of course, has been uh, a problem for centuries. Uh, African sleeping sickness and 
in more recent times, AIDS has been an epidemic that's been a, a real problem for Africa. You know, your book makes the point that Africa has a very complex linguistic uh, tradition, uh, partly because uh, the indigenous languages, very few have written traditions, even though there's you know, over a thousand uh, spoken languages, not all of them have a written tradition. Add into that the fact that you had colonialism that occurred where essentially a European language was imposed on the population. And so you actually wind up with a mosaic of local languages uh, with in some cases a, a lingua franca, a common language uh, known by most of the population. As complicated as the language is, religion is also a complicated thing in Africa. You have what's called animism uh, that was common among a lot of the indigenous peoples. Uh, add to that then the infiltration of Christianity brought by Europeans, as well as the influx and the influence of Islam from portions of the uh, of Southwest Asia. Okay, so unlike some of the other locations we have studied so far in the course, um, Africa is not nearly as urbanized as uh, a lot of the other continents we've, just, we've studied. Uh, in fact, 37% of Sub-Saharan Africans uh, reside in urban settlements. So therefore a lot of folks live uh, out in the country essentially. Africa is certainly a diamond in the rough in the sense that it's got a lot of upside, a lot of economic potential. And the question is how to get that potential to develop into reality and allow for the greatest number of people to share in prosperity uh, to avoid essentially a neo-colonialism. That's, that's a word that's mentioned in there. We already talked about the colonial era uh, and essentially how the countries then earned their independence or gained their independence in the 20th century. And now the, the question is, can you prevent Africa from being exploited for its resources as it was in the past by other foreign countries, you know, China, US, uh, areas in Europe that need the resources, need the energies that are available in, in Africa, how can th those commodities be traded, but be traded fairly and the revenues generated be distributed fairly throughout the population? So to avoid neocolonialism, what is a possible solution? Because quite often a lot of these countries are, are, are small and economically not very powerful. They can't build the infrastructure that they need to develop economically. So one solution would be to just allow the foreign investors to take over and uh, dictate the terms. Another option is to essentially uh, unite, have a lot of the African countries uh, share resources, share, uh, share responsibility and share negotiating power when dealing with foreign investors. So the idea of having supranationalism or essentially creating trade organizations to uh, be able to stand up to and, and, and have a little more influence in these uh, trade deals, trade negotiations. Okay, and the regions we'll be covering are as follows. They're kind of color coded here. You got, of course, Southern Africa. Um, you got East Africa. And you've got Equatorial Africa. You got West Africa, the yellow, and then you have your transition regions. Transition region uh, in kind of Central Africa, as well as, of course, Madagascar, we have to sort of treat as somewhat of a transition region because it is set apart from the mainland. Okay, so the first region we're going to discuss is Southern Africa, and it consists of 10 countries. And one thing the book points out is that this is a very materially rich region. It's also agriculturally diverse and rich and has really underperformed. And that's the focus of this, uh, of the next several pages will be to, to discuss, you know, what are the reasons why this region that is so, so uh, rich in natural resources 
uh, not more prosperous. In case you remember your book described how the indigenous people of Africa uh, worked their way from West Africa southward and eventually essentially ran into a cul-de-sac that had developed down here in, in South Africa. Uh, later on then, of course, uh, the Europeans arrived in this region because, of course, it's a very advantageous position. Notice how uh, this is essentially where the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean uh, connect. And so it was the, part of the spice trade as uh, the Europeans were sailing around Africa. It wound up being an advantageous place to develop. And in fact, as early as 1652, uh, Cape Town was developed. And it was British as well as Dutch people who uh, essentially were settling in what is now South Africa, fighting for power, fighting, fighting for territory. Eventually, this culminated in the Boer War of the early 20th century. Obviously, uh, South Africa has had a very checkered past, and one of its worst parts of its history, uh, a large part of its 20th century history, was uh, apartheid. Apartheid being uh, a system of social government where segregation and discrimination were legal. Uh, and it was essentially the white European minority that allowed allowed for this and, and actually uh, promoted a separate development between uh, blacks and whites. Obviously, the ethnic makeup is not that simple. It's not just white Europeans and, and black uh, indigenous people. There's also a uh, you know, a mixture of the various ethnicities that live in South Africa and make up the country, uh, particularly South Asians. If you recall, if you ever heard about uh, Mohandas Gandhi, uh, he started out his career as a young attorney in South Africa. Clearly, South Africa has plenty of natural riches. Uh, it's, it's, it's synonymous with, with the diamond trade. Uh, there's gold, there's coal, there's iron, all kinds of raw materials that are available uh, in South Africa. So you would expect it to be an economic powerhouse. And in, in Africa, as far as Africa goes, uh, on relative terms, uh, it is a powerhouse. But on the world stage, it's not. And part of it was due to uh, apartheid. The fact that this, this social discrimination really held the country back, if only because of the sanctions, the strict sanctions that were imposed upon it by foreign governments. Okay, so being the powerhouse economically, obviously there's going to be some urban centers in, in South Africa. Among them, of course, you've already mentioned Cape Town, but Johannesburg is a part of this economic core of South Africa. It started out as a mining town, but has grown, grown, and grown uh, to be so much more. Uh, but it does indeed have its challenges, of course, uh, as almost all large cities, uh, there are issues as far as uh, disparities between rich and poor and shanty towns and, and uh, infrastructure issues. And for Johannesburg, also uh, smog and, and, and environmental issues are an ongoing problem. So what are the challenges for South Africa? Well, it's still very commodity dependent. And that's, that's all. We've, we've learned about this in, in South America as well. Um, a lack of manufacturing, a lack of uh, improving your commodities or processing your commodities to, to be a value added sort of an export uh, is a problem, especially when commodity values drop, you know, then, then that really becomes an issue. This, and in a post-apartheid era, of course, the discrimination is no longer legal, uh, but there's still huge disparities between the races. Uh, this is a legacy of apartheid and poor education and poor access to jobs and that sort of thing. So there's still a lot of need to to uh, to address the inequalities uh, between the races, a need for land reform. And of course, South Africa wants to join BRIC. You know, there's been a lifting of sanctions and that sort of thing, but it's still not a big enough economy, not a strong enough economy to really rival the other members of the BRIC. Okay, your book describes the middle tier states as those that are bordering South Africa. Uh, two of them are, are very small, actually traditional kingdoms, Lesotho and Swaziland. Uh, 
And notice that they, they use the term remittances. You know, these countries really depend upon the money that is sent back by their natives who are working now in another, another country. You know, a lot of them working in the mines of South Africa, sending money back to Lesotho and Swaziland. Um, so the economies of those two countries really depend upon those remittances. A couple of other countries mentioned, Namibia, Botswana, and uh, the book does a nice job of discussing Zimbabwe, um, which has a lot of things going for it. It should be a vibrant economy. Unfortunately, it uh, was under the rule of Robert Mugabe for many, many decades, and it really uh, kept its, uh, its economic engine from really running. The fastest growing economy in the world, largely oil dependent, and most of its oil exporting goes to China. Um, and the problem with, with oil exportation in particular, you know, the, in a lot of cases, a lot of these commodities, ex, uh, commodities exportations, uh, the government benefits, but as far as the number of people that, it, that are employed in the actual, the actual uh, industry of oil production is relatively few. Uh, so the government benefits and and that allows for corruption and such between those that are in power but as far as how much actual how much of the economic prosperity works its way down to uh, the man on the street is uh, quite often problematic Okay, on the other side, on the Atlantic coast um, of the northern tier, you have Mozambique, and again, it's a, it's almost a one commodity economy. In this case, it's not oil rich, but it is bauxite rich. Bauxite is the ore from which aluminum is is uh, derived, and the, you know the problem is that the fluctuations in world prices for that commodity can have huge, huge impacts on the economy of the country. Zambia and Malawi are landlocked countries in the northern tier, and uh, both are experiencing modest economic growth. Uh, Malawi, largely on the strength of its agriculture, and Zambia uh, has garnered some interest from the Chinese for some of their, their resources. Now, if you have images in your head about Africa, you may be thinking of essentially East Africa. This is uh, home to the Serengeti. National Park, and you know, this is home to Lake Victoria and Angel Falls. So, the real natural beauty of Africa—not that it's all not all beautiful, but a lot of the uh, the beauty that has been packaged for a Western audience uh, seems to uh, reside in East Africa. One thing you'll notice is, as the uh, different countries are discussed, is uh, following independence, which path to development the different countries took. Some went a more communist route, and some took more of a ca capitalist approach. And, and Kenya is one of those that took a capitalist approach and, and had some success. Um, its economy boomed largely on the, on the uh, strength of tourism and agriculture. Uh, and population grew, and with the population growth, uh, means more development. More development means incur in incursion into uh, some of the natural environment, uh, and therefore that winds up being a negative feedback. Because if you, if you have tourism based on the strength of how beautiful your environment is, uh, the the economic prosperity and the population growth uh, then causes you to start to uh, make inroads and develop regions that had been known for being wild places and wild spaces, and that can affect your tourism, which is essentially the negative feedback that Kenya has had to, had to go through. The per capita income on average in Kenya is $1,600 US dollars, but the average income of the Kenyan parliament is $156,000. <laughs> so that tells you that it definitely uh, pays, literally, to be part of the government. And obviously that means there's a lot of corruption going on there.
following independence, Tanzania took a more communist route and uh, for a while was one of the poorest countries in the world. It has uh, righted the ship a little bit. It's actually a leading gold producer and its economy is growing now in uh, recent decades. A little more political stability. Uganda is another East African country that struggled after, well, struggled during colonization, but during, in post-colonial times, um, Uganda struggled largely because of its dictatorial rule for several decades. Uh, Idi Amin, until 1980, uh, was a dictator in Uganda and really uh, restricted its economic development. Uh, after Amin was gone, then the country was ravaged by the AIDS epidemic and uh, is only now gaining a bit of a foothold economically, but still being a landlocked country does have a challenge uh, as far as increasing its amount of trade. The, uh, the country of Rwanda may ring a bell if you recall. Several years ago, there was a movie called The Hotel Rwanda. And these are, Rwanda and Burundi are both countries that, again, because of the colonialism, um, we want, they're the victims of partitioning uh, that does not reflect, the borders that were drawn by the, by the uh, Europeans did not reflect the complex ethnic groups and social groups. And so what these countries were, were, in, were essentially uh, created. Um, and, and during the colonial times, uh, certain ethnic groups were favored over others. And, and, uh, and there was natural tensions that were, that were built up, which have only resulted in genocide and tribalism uh, that continue to, to make the entire political landscape quite unstable. For the majority of the population are subsistence farmers and uh, the country actually needs to import food from relief agencies to keep everyone fed and large tracts of its arable farmland are actually being sold or leased to foreign agribusinesses. Madagascar is located, it's, it's placed within the, within the East Africa region strictly by the geography. It's close to East Africa, even though it is offshore, it's not part of the mainland. Uh, culturally and, and socially, it doesn't really belong to Africa at all. It actually has more in common with South Asia than it does uh, the rest of Africa. But it does, of course, have uh, a lot of issues that are discussed on page 321, particularly environmental degradation uh, is, a, is a major concern in Madagascar. Okay, the next region, we've already done South Africa or Southern Africa, we've done East Africa. Now we're getting to Equatorial Africa. So obviously the equator, uh, notice here's zero latitude. So the equator runs smack dab through this region. Um, one thing that's mentioned in the book, this is possibly the, the most troubled region in the entire realm. You can notice that we have uh, Sudan, uh, which is the victim of a civil war, which actually partitioned into Sudan and South Sudan, Central African Republic, uh, DR Congo, notice there's the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo, and then the Congo, uh, a lot of civil war, a lot of strife in this region. Okay, your book describes some of the challenges that the Democratic Republic of the Congo faces. It has a lot going for it yet again, uh, but much that's going against it. Part of the problem with the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a physiogeographic uh, issue or physiographic issue in the sense that it's got a tropical rainforest that makes up much of the center of the country. Not much, not much development there. Uh, most of the development is in the periphery, which means that there's uh, issues as far as making connections, not a whole lot of infrastructure. Uh, so it's a lar relatively large country to govern, um, but not a whole lot of communications, transportation from one part of the country to the other. If there's a right spot in equal equatorial Africa, it, are, are, it is the Atlantic coastal states, those that have uh, essentially ports on the Atlantic. 
uh, not only because of the trade possibilities, but also because there are more and more oil reserves being discovered in this general region. Uh, again, for the, one of the problems being that with oil, uh, apart from the few jobs that are provided for production, um, the revenues generated have a hard time working their way down to the common person. The next country mentioned is South Sudan. Now, of course, your book details how the British colonized Sudan and actually combined the northern Islamized section with the southern Christianized section. And that was uh, bound to uh, wind up in civil war. So sure enough, when, when independence occurred in 1956, uh, it didn't take long, well, it took a couple of decades of uh, of civil war before the two countries finally had to uh, split up. Okay, so we've done Southern Africa and East Africa and Equatorial Africa. Now we're moving on to West Africa. And notice the West Africa, uh, well, first of all, it's mentioned that it's, it's, a, it's a very populous, relatively populous part of the uh, continent. Notice that also it was right there along the, the African coast where, again, the slave trade was in full swing. Um, thanks to the Europeans. Notice another thing that you're, we're relatively close to kind of this transition zone, the Sahel here, which is the southern part of the Sahara, as well as uh, this, of course, uh, tends to mark sort of a, a, a line of division between where Islam is predominant versus uh, where traditional religions and or Christianity are, uh, are more, uh, hold more sway. So, uh, this, this area, as is mentioned, was essentially colonized by the British and the French with one Portuguese uh, colony. A common theme for West Africa will be the difference between the coastal regions versus the inland areas. And quite often there's a kind of a, a battle for political power. Uh, and in this case, not only the battle uh, difference in just the type of economy that occurs in the coastal region versus the inland, but also the fact that you have a big disparity in religion, big religious differences, uh, where the north is definitely uh, uh, dominated by Islam, whereas the south is non-Islamic. And the way the the colony was set up uh, was that there was more preference for the non-Islamic portion of the country. And describes how Nigeria did go through a very brief period of economic prosperity, but but uh, with fluctuations in world oil prices and overbuilding in some cases, um, corruption in some cases, and borrowing against future oil profits led to an economic downturn in Nigeria. And coupled with that, with that economic downturn, an ascendance of uh, Islamism in the northern part of the country actually led to uh, Sharia law being imposed in portions of the northern parts of the, of the country. So certainly Nigeria is the big kid on the block when it comes to West Africa, but there are other countries in the region, including some interior countries, some, some landlocked countries such as Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, relatively small populations, mostly subsistence farming, and uh, those countries are dealing with issues of desert, desert, desertification, uh, meaning a lack of arable farmland. Um, other coastal countries include Benin and Togo, Burkina Faso, Ghana, uh, the Ivory Coast, it was uh, colonized by the French, it's Côte d'Ivoire. Another coastal country is Senegal, which is surprisingly stable uh, in a general region that has been marked by instability. Uh, part of the reason being that there is a certain amount of homogeneity uh, in the population, 95% of them are Muslim, uh, and they've had representative government and de democratic elections, which is also a relative rarity in this part of Africa. Contrasting Senegal's relative stability, now we deal with countries like Liberia and Sierra Leone, which have been fragmented by civil war. Liberia uh, fell into civil war 
uh, 1989 and really didn't recover until uh, the 2000s. It seems to have turned a bit of a corner, uh, electing its Africa's first female president in 2006. Okay, then finally, our last region is the African transition zone, and there is a climate transition. This is an area where we're kind of on the southern boundary of the Sahara Desert, uh, and also a cultural or religious transition in the sense that to the north of this, what's called the Islamic Front, let me change my color here, the Islamic Front, I'll draw it in green, um, it's right here, and essentially north of that front, Islam predominates, whereas to the south of the front, Christianity or more traditional religions, animism, uh, predominates. And just like a weather front, it's not fixed uh, due to changes in population. Uh, this can change, it can fluctuate either moving northward or southward. But in general, that's the general transition zone that can be drawn. Okay, so this African transition zone includes what's called the Horn of Africa, this point off the east coast of Africa that is bordering the Indian Ocean, the Gulf of Aden, and the Red Sea. Uh, obviously, this is a very important area for oil shipping. Uh, it's also a, an area that, again, is dominated by Islam. In fact, Djibouti is 97% Muslim mini-state. You can see Djibouti's right there. Eritrea is also mentioned. It used to be a, a portion of Ethiopia. Okay, Ethiopia is a large country in the African transition zone, and it's a country that has uh, dealt with a lot of strife over time, in no small part due to the fact there's a lot of uh, religious differences. A third of the population is Muslim. The core, the highland area, is Christian. Notice on the previous slide, uh, chaos was mentioned in Ethiopia. The same can be said of Somalia. In fact, Somalia is essentially a failed state. It's been fragmented into a couple of different uh, uh, regions that are not necessarily recognized by all governments, but essentially uh, there is no single Somali government that's able to, uh, to control the entire region. Notice that also because of the desert and lack of uh, arable land, a lot of Somalis live in Ethiopia. This is a very powerful video. I encourage you to, uh, to watch it. In fact, the closing line of it is this no man's land of hopelessness. Uh, in describing this refugee camp, folks who have uh, had, to be, had to move out of Somalia due to the unrest and are living in portions of Kenya, some for more than a decade. And uh, you know, the overall theme is that you know, Kenya has received refugees from Somalia for over 20 years. And this video looks at how the United Nations aid for these refugees is viewed by some as supportive, while others see it as a hindrance. And I encourage you to watch it and make your own, make your own decision. Okay, so as we wrap up this, the module on Sub-Saharan Africa, a couple of questions for you to, to kind of think. Think about it. so many sub-Saharan African countries have abundant natural resources, and yet they struggle to develop them. So how does the physical geography play a factor? Why is infrastructure so important? How does cultural diversity impact development in some cases? And why do their influences play a role?